Julie Andrews, and Emma Walton Hamilton. Hello. I'm Julie. That's Emma. Might <laughs> not recognize us 40 years later. <laughs> so, how did this all begin? This film? Yeah. It has a sweet history, actually. Um, believe it or not, Blake had been in a very down period. He was quite often qu quite depressive. And he'd been in a very bad state. And one day he was sitting in the jacuzzi. I was with him, our daughter, his, his daughter, Jennifer, whom I think you, some of you may have met when she came here uh, a few weeks ago and spoke. Um, but he said, suddenly out of the blue, Blake said, you know what I'd really like to do? I'd like to make a non-union film he said, I think I'm entitled to one in my life. I've always done union. I'm entitled. And he said, and I'd like to just cast friends, family, and just make, make it all together. And then he vaguely gave an outline of what he thought he might do with the story. And I thought, honest to God, because Blake had six ideas a week, didn't he, darling? Excuse my back. And um, I thought, oh, yeah, you know, I'll believe that when I see oh, it. Oh, and he said, and I'd like to shoot it here at the house. Here on, on, on the property, our property. So I said, oh, right, okay, well, whatever. And six weeks later, we had trucks and, and porta potties and God knows what all over the place and a swarming crew. And uh, it, it thus began one of the sweetest experiences because it was Blake's idea, Sometimes, not all his movies, but um, there, there are, I think, the, like probably The Party, this one, and oh, what else am I thinking about? No, probably just The Party and this one. Anyway, um, he liked to try experimental film, and he said to all of us on the first day, and we were all friends, and to work with lovely M and Jenny and his son, uh, Chris, Jackson. Yeah, Jackson, yeah. We became a family, in a way, second family. But but uh, he said, I'm giving you a 16-page outline of what I'd like you to uh, do. This is your what your character is, and that was outlined also. So the general shape of the film was on the pages. And then he said, but I want you all to work out how it goes, and you'll in essence, make it up as you go along. And I thought, oh, there's going to be egos rampant all over the place because uh, we're all actors. But strangely, honestly, Julia, there was not one problem. We all deferred to the... I would have said, don't you, darling? We all deferred to the other. And basically, the film, in a much more dynamic and dramatic and funny way is Blake showing what he went through in a way. And um, and I had truthfully gone through that with him, uh, of course, as his wife. And um, at the end of the film, when I tell him off, he said, just go, do it, you know, and I'm making it up as I go along. And what, do I take my courage in both hands? Yes. Anyway, I let fly with what I, thought was appropriate, and it was one take, and afterwards I said, Blake, was that all right? He said, fine, cut. And I said, okay? He said, honey, trust me. And he smiled, and uh, obviously knew me well enough or something. But, uh, but darling, tell a little bit about some of the interesting, funny bits that happened. Well, uh, the one most interesting thing was that because it was a non-union film, um, very quickly, the union got wind of it, and they were not happy. Uh, and we had uh, union picketing going on outside the house, outside the property on Pacific Coast Highway, and also the property was on the beach, on a bluff overlooking the beach. 
And so they were on the beach and they were on Pacific Coast Highway almost every day that we were filming and trying to disrupt the the shoot. And so they had, in addition to the Union Rat, uh, the giant Union Rat, they had drums and they had air horns and they did everything in their power to, um, yeah, to, to try and disrupt the filming and we would have to pause and wait or shoot at an odd time of day or move the shoot to a different space indoors where we had better sound protection. And, um, but we managed to get through it. And the only real casualty was our, our director of photography, our, our cinematographer who was, um, at the time was Harry Stradling, who Blake had worked with on several other movies and who was a member of the union and the Directors Guild and the union pressured him into having to withdraw from the project. And so we were very, very fortunate. Um, that happened fairly early on to get uh, his replacement, which was a very a terrific cinematographer f- who was British um, named Tony Richmond. And he flew in on a moment's notice. And because he was from Britain, he wasn't part of the union. And, uh, and he took over and he, sh- 90% of the film is his, I think, 95%. Yeah, about 90, maybe yeah. 85. Yeah. yeah. And then the other thing that was, was amusing was that because we were, we were living in the house while we were shooting at the house. <laughs> and, um, I was, staying in my childhood bedroom and you were in your bedroom and um and the camera crews would come in at you know five six in the morning and start laying cable and setting up lights and and cameras and so forth and, and we then shot in both those rooms. yeah we did and then they would you know by two in the morning or whatever they'd be still wrapping up their Gear. Blake and I would go to bed and we'd say, listen, excuse us, yeah, I'd take all the makeup off and all of that, climb into bed and they're still taking down the rigging. And we said, don't, <laughs> don't mind us, you know. Well, and the other, th- the other thing is that so many nights we did run very late, really late. And so uh, I, as the lady of the house, would end up doing scrambled eggs at three in the morning for some of the crew that were left. And then get up in the morning and discover bodies lying on the carpet or on the couches yeah, all around because they hadn't home. gone home. It's true. Yeah, and it was sort of mayhem but sort of wonderful. And Jack, well, all of us were, had a ball, and he was an angel to work with, really lovely, lovely guy. Blake said to me that he's one of his favorite uh, actors to work with. He just has an instant knowledge and depth and truthfully to watch Blake coaching or guiding Jack in this sort of breakdown when he's on his bike and all of that. Blake was not on a bike but he was certainly very very depressed and to watch him tell him tell Jack how to do it was quite daunting and the funny thing was that once he'd made the film it seemed almost as if it was a catharsis for him and he was much, much better, I'm happy to say. And uh, I realized it was all about love. And in a way, uh, Blake saying, I'm sorry, I caused so much trouble to the family. Uh, just a very endearing, crazy, mixed up, delightful film, really. Um, was it difficult for you to say yes to having a crew in your house, to having... Uh, a character that is so close to who you are, you know, yes, to some yes. of your traits and, and have your husband, you know, all, that's a lot of privacy uh, it is. on that screen. And also the hardest thing was that we had other children uh, and in the house also. I had two little babies. Uh, what, how old were you? No, they were, they were like 12 and 13 at were the they? time. Yeah. But they were almost, they weren't in the movie, but... They were going to school every day. Yes, they were. And Emma and um, Jenny were in the movie, but they weren't. And they were part of the family and they were unhappy about that. And I had to really kind of keep them occupied and safe and so on. But somehow, I don't know how, it was just the love between all these friends and being on our property, which put, in a funny way, it put me at my ease because I kind of knew my way around and so on. What t- Talk about uh, Joe Lopes. Oh, well, uh, uh, yes, a lot of the, as you say, a lot of the people in the film were family friends or extended friends of the family, uh, specifically um, 
the man who played the doctor, mom's doctor in the film, Jordan Christopher, was the husband uh, at the time. They later separated, sadly, but uh, he was married to Sybil Christopher, who co-founded Bay Street Theater with Stephen and me. Um, so that was, uh, they, they were real old doctor friends. Played, was he in the movie? He wasn't. No, he, he wasn't, wasn't in the movie. But he was in every one of Blake's other and the, movies. The other thing that was interesting was the man who played Jennifer's husband, Matt Latanzi, was in real life married to Olivia Newton-John. And she was pregnant with their baby at the time. And for some reason, I think they didn't have a, they lived very close to the, our house. Um, and I guess they didn't have a pool because she was in our pool every morning before we started shooting. <laughs> Yeah, that was and because she was, was pregnant, really and that was great exercise for her. So, yeah, there was a lot of kind of extended she family. And Jenny were great, great friends, weren't they? But I didn't, I didn't actually play the saxophone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did. I learned. I had a six-week crash course. Um, but the man who taught me to play the saxophone is the man who is actually playing in the band in the party scene. Um, sweet man with a beard. His name was Joe Lopes, and he was my mom's. Uh, horn, all horns, Woodwind, basically, yeah. yeah um, whenever she went on tour, on concert tour to Japan and places like that. Yeah, one of the sweetest guys. He was, he was an angel. And, and, Emma, um, what, did you expect to be asked to be in the film? And what were you doing at the time? You were in New York, I right? was living in New York, yeah. I had been living in New York for six or seven years, and um, I was pursuing a life as an actor. And... Um, studying training at HP Studio and doing uh, soap operas and television commercials and some off-Broadway stuff and um, taking a lot of classes. And Blake said, come out and be in this movie. And um, and, I brought, and Chutney was my dog. <laughs> and I had actually just, had br been, believe it or not, I had... was our dog. Yeah, Honey was there. Honey was there yeah. um, and I had just broken up. When Blake started writing the film, he, I had just, in fact, broken up with my boyfriend, whom I had been with for several years. Um, and very presciently, presciently, Blake created the character of this boyfriend in the movie named Steve, <laughs> who is my husband, who is sitting here in the front row. But we were not a couple at that time, so it was... Uh, it was I have to thank Blake for seeing into the future. <laughs> and, and another connection is, you know, in the, in the film, everybody tells Harvey that they should see a psychiatrist. Yes. And 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 he's uh, Blake's psychiatrist as co-credit as yes. as a, as a yeah, screenwriter, yeah, right? right? Yeah, yeah. What, what was his contribution? I think he just loved to come down and watch sometimes, or well, that, work with Steve. I don't. I, he he helped the. Um, he helped create the treatment that we worked from. Now, I'm not sure it's... Uh, he did. And then I remember we would sit uh, in the first week or so of rehearsals before we started shooting. We had meetings and rehearsals and character discussions. And he would weigh in on what so-and-so would say in this situation because it was unscripted. I think it was more... He did more the... Um, the Man Who Loved Women. And uh, yeah, he, no, was he was... He was on this film, yeah, too. Yeah, he was. Uh, yeah. But um, but then the the actual dialogue came from us. So he and Blake would say, "This is this is what we hope will happen in this scene." And then we would shoot it. We shot in sequence, um, which is unusual for films. And uh, in the morning, we would start with improv exercises, improv work, and we would improvise the scenes. And the our amazing and ever patient continuity person was scribbling down every word we said, and, then what, what and from there, it yeah, and from there it would get scripted through the improv, and then uh, and then we would shoot based on what we had arrived at, where Blake had said, "Keep that, you know, throw that out." Yeah. yeah. But, but you, I mean, you said before that that Your last monologue of yours, you know, when you. Yeah, really let him know. let him have it. It's just coming oh, off. Um, I'll take it off. Um, uh, um, uh, that was like one take, which is incredible. Yes. Was it always like that? It's so magic, most of the film that that no, you no. you shot I mean, a lot. Sometimes we did it again for some reason, or because we had um, a television built in, or a, um, another camera built into the film camera. 
which a lot of people in Hollywood do, we were able to see an instant playback rather than wait for the dailies to come in the following day. And so we would see an instant playback and you'd say, oh God, I wish I'd said that. that, that what you, being able to see what you've just said helped you say, I, I'd love to just add that because that would punch the point home and so on. So sometimes we shot quite often more than one take, but that was one take and that's when Blake smiled and said, trust me, he knew me well, I guess. <laughs> Raise your hand if you if you have a question. But there's one there. No, hold on, hold on for the mic. Sorry. Thank you. How long did it take to make the movie? Eight, Eight weeks. Eight or ten. Weeks. Yeah, but yeah. September, October, and a bit of November. That's just to shoot it, but then you have to edit and cut it, and you know, go put it, add the music, and all of that. Yeah. Did that making the movie together as a family impact on your personal relationships? No, I, I didn't find that. Did you, darling? No, I don't. I mean, I, I think it. Inf I think our personal relationships informed the relationships in the film more than the other way around. Um, we, you know, it wasn't the first time we'd worked together. We had actually, I'd actually done little walk-ons and cameos in other films of Blake's and mom had worked with Blake many times obviously over the years and um the, so the big bedroom scene was probably our m main huge one wasn't it darling in my bedroom scene mm, yeah yeah actually that helped I will say that that helped uh, knowing that she was m my mom um I, that I worried about that scene in the weeks leading up to it because I was afraid of having to cry and having the tears available and um if, uh, would they sustain through because we rehearsed you know we first we improvised it then we rehearsed it then we shot it and then you don't just times. shoot one take you shoot the main scene and then you could cut in for a close-up and a close-up and or an over the shoulder or a lower shot but and the fact that it was my mom my actual mom my real life mom not, not just an actor <laughs> Um, it helped enormously because when I sort of folded into her, it was her perfume and it was like, mommy. <laughs> you know? Also, I remember, I do remember saying to you, hold it, hold it. Don't yeah. try to cry. I try not to Hold cry. back, hold back till the till cameras the are rolling. The close up is right there and then let it fly because otherwise you don't have anything left by the time you get to that, you know? Yeah, it's true. Yeah. But anyway. No, hold on for the microphone. Somebody's here with a microphone for you. <laughs> Although I can hear you, I don't know if the others can. No, but we need to uh, be um, able to record. I went upstairs to the third floor and I saw the notes that you wrote in your script for That's Life. Oh, what was it? I don't remember that. Well, you said a lot about look up to the clouds and like you were giving yourself a note of what you should be doing when oh, you deliver was that the line. the crying scene? Yes. Yeah. And so my question is, did you write all of those notes because you didn't have a script or is that how you actually worked out all well, of your like characters? Well, it was like if I was going to shoot a, another take of it, maybe the following... Use the mic, Mom. Oh, sorry. If I was going to shoot another take of it the following day for some reason or whatever, um, or maybe ahead of time, I made a note to myself. It was like, that was mostly probably when I was saying, oh God, oh God, help me. And I think, I know that's what I would have done. So yeah. <laughs> that's what I did. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, Sally Kellerman was lovely in that too. Very she sweet. Fantastic. Do, you, do you, you, you notate all your scripts, right? Pretty much, or just this one was more intense. Say that again. You, 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 know, you, you, know, you make notes on most of your scripts. Oh yeah, right? I mean, as you, as pre- filming pre anything really and um, just thinking about what you might do and in this case so much of it we didn't know until we got to that scene I didn't know what would happen with Sally when I was doing that crying scene I only knew my bit and um, it worked so well it really did yeah movie yeah very good well, at least I felt it did <laughs> Hi. Uh, my question is kind of a general question regarding the leading men in roles in your career. Uh, actually, I mean, Jack Lemmon was fantastic in this movie. But my question is, 
Earlier in your career, you worked with uh, Rex Harrison and Richard Burton and even Christopher Plummer. And being that it was early in your career... And James Garner. Oh, well, I, 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 li- I put James Garner in the category with, say, Dudley Moore and Jack Lemmon and all okay, of those. Okay. So what I'm asking is, as far as them being or appearing to be a bit curmudgeon or, you know a little bit different in personality at that point. And it was very early in your career. How did you work with them? Was it harder to work with them? Were you intimidated at all because it was so early in your career? Early in my career. Most of a nicer, yeah. more gentle Rex actor. Harrison, for sure, uh, scared the heck out of me because I actually, that was for theater on Broadway. I didn't know how to act and I didn't know what I was doing. And thank God for a phenomenal director, the great, great Moss Hart, and he saved my life. And we had a quiet weekend together, he and I. Well, I could go on forever about that weekend, but um, he, he, uh, he really dismissed the entire company and I was really floundering. I knew there was something in me that could do it, but I just didn't know any direction. I'd never had any training as a professional actor. My my training come, came from vaudeville and music hall and variety. Anyway, uh, Moss worked with me for two days and said, Julie, it's not going to be easy. And I will, um, this is complete diversion from the film, but he said, um, I'm, I'm, I don't have the time to be nice, but you must know that I really, really want this to be a, a good thing between us and not something that makes you unhappy. And then he really waded in and at times he would say, no, that's more like a schoolgirl. don't do that, do this. Or he'd get up and demonstrate or he'd, anyway, by the 48 hours, had, by the time it had ended, he, um, I was able to face the whole company with a lot more confidence and it wasn't perfect by any means, but then I was in that show for three and a half years, eight performances a week, and it gives you plenty of time to practice and learn it and and learn your craft. So that was the beginning. At which point Rex had more respect, I think. He did, yeah. He would, yes, I mean, at the beginning he wanted me to go home and uh, (laughs) told the producers that and so on. But I could sing, and um, that's what the... uh, the best part of what I gave to the show was those wonderful songs. But I learned about Eliza and I knew her and I knew what I wanted. It was just letting it out somehow and finding the courage and feeling that I was safe. And Moss gave me that more than you could possibly. Also, he said to his wife, she, he said, she went, he went home after the 48 hours and he, this is absolutely true. And she said, how did it go? How was she? And he said, oh, she has that terrible British strength that makes you wonder why they lost India. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's Moss Hart. But then he said, you know, really what I should have done was, you know, we should have gone up to the Plaza Hotel for a weekend and we'd have made passionate love to each other and she'd have emerged Monday morning a star. And Kitty, his wife, said, well, we know we love each other. If you really want to do that, go ahead. You know. It's absolutely true. No, you know what's on YouTube? A, an approximation of those rehearsals on a special that we did. I don't think the real rehearsals were ever filmed, but we did do a, a big television special about Lerner and Lowe and, and all our problems. Um, st- uh, Rex, his problem was more singing the music, and uh, but he was so brilliant, um, but very very demanding and different. And but I would watch him sometimes, forgetting who I should be, because he was just amazing. His sense of timing with an audience, if somebody was coughing or if it was a rainy night or whatever, and he felt that they might have missed his line, he would fudge and then go back to the beginning of the line again so that the audience could hear the whole thing. Very interesting techniques, yeah. Hi, first I have to say it's such an honor being able to (laughs) speak with you. I've loved you my whole entire life. Um, Seeing you just now in that beautiful black Mm -hmm. outfit in the end, 
um, remind me you have so many iconic and beautiful costumes in your films. So I was wondering what film had your favorite and were you able to keep it, any of them? And also, <laughs> on the topic of costumes, I did draw you something and I would love to be able to give it to you, if that's possible. Uh, that's <laughs> kind of you, thank you. I'd, that would be fine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, favorite costumes, well, depending on what the subject was and uh, the costumes in Darling Lily were beautiful and they were designed by Donald Brooks. The beautiful red dress in SOB was Theodora Van Runkel. And um, it's hard to say what was my favorite. And no, I wasn't given any of them. But, <laughs> but also, the, the first man that ever designed costumes for film was my husband, which was Tony Walton. I mean, imagine how blessed I was to have that to help me on the first film I ever made, which was Mary Poppins. <laughs> but. Um, and, and he helped enormously with the costumes. Once you're in costume, it's so much easier to then delve and retreat into your character. Yeah, I can't think of any other. Uh, totally inappropriate, but what jumped into my mind was that 10, the costumes for the film 10 were designed by Blake's ex-wife. <laughs> And she, she made me, her look <laughs> fabulous. She put yes. her in leather pants. Lady I barely she... knew, but had given us all so much trouble. And it was a sweet lady, but very lost. I'm sorry. But um, Blake said to me, Julia, I have to ask you a favor. Would you mind terribly if I asked her to design the costumes for the film? And I said, what? <laughs> uh, I'd have to go into the dressing room and strip and get, you know, down to my bra and panties and things. And uh, he said, honey, I don't know how to ask you anymore, but asking you to be kind, because I, if she gets into the union, then she's set, and I don't have to worry and quite so much, and so on and so forth. And of course, I did get what he meant, and she turned out to make me look just extraordinary. I'd never done a film without a bra. I'd never worn leather pants before, you know. I was hot stuff, and bless, bless her heart, we did become good friends. <laughs> you rotter. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, Emma, since your daughter, Hope, is now involved in the theater, is, um, I'm sorry, Hope. <laughs> Is there any potential or prospect of collaboration with the three of you to continue the family involvement with oh, the arts? We've done it already. Thank you. We? That's lovely of you. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we did do it together last summer. Uh, there is a musical adaptation of one of the children's books that my mother and I wrote together called The Great American Mousical, um, which we're... Mind. Will you folks keep yeah, it we're in still, mind? Yeah, uh, we're still developing and looking for a future home for. Um, but last summer we did um, a staged reading, a concert version at Bay Street Theater as part of its developmental process. And Hope performed one of the leads in it and brilliant uh, beautifully absolutely beautifully with uh, sang you know one of the best songs in the show and um, and that was really special it was it was too short um, but it was really spectacular because mom was directing so uh, I was I, I really was, there was nervous too because you want to give so much and you don't want to horn in or make it too tough I hope I didn't darling <laughs> Question. So, is that they, I think Diana. Yes, well. lady. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I just want to say that I loved this movie when I saw it at the age of around thirty-five, <laughs> but seeing it now that I've just turned seventy-five, it has a very, very different meaning. And so, there's two things I wonder if you could say more about them. One is about the power of ritual to take people through these passages in life. I think the party scene is deceptively simple. I mean, I think it, it's, it's, it, it really is a profound scene, or series of scenes. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. That carries him through um, this you know, character. Without his having any knowledge of what this lady is going through in the, ca exactly. the character. Exactly, yeah. but that's was the other thing that I found quite profound, is what is the impact of depression on the family, 
And I think everybody who acted in this film, I think, did a beautiful job of, you know, I'm sure some of it was real. You said he was going through a depression. Oh, oh. And so I think it was, you know, it wasn't a melodrama. It was lighthearted, even about things like infidelity. But it also was grave about what is the impact on the whole family and particularly the marriage. You know, I thought some of the most amazing acting was your response to his depressive mood and insensitivity. And I just wonder if you could say more about that. Well, thank you very much. What a lovely thing to say and very perceptive. Um, well, to a great extent, in terms of Blake's depression, we did all live through that. He'd, he'd be, you know, manic, he'd be not manic depressive, but he'd have good highs and happy times, particularly when he was writing. He couldn't have been more in his element and, and directing. He loved all that. But the down times, uh, he wasn't very good when I had to go off and do a concert or uh, so, some other film somewhere. He was very miserable and abandoned and all of that. But, um, but he was the most charismatic man I've ever met. And to this day, when I look at his photograph, I, I miss him and there's that intangible something that you can't put, put your hand on, but he just moved my heart so well. Um, but I think by that time, I knew what he was aiming for in the movie. Um, and watching him coach Jack in that respect was, as I say, quite a revelation because I didn't know that Blake or this depressive man who had been depressive was aware of what he did, what he said. And yet here he was showing Jack exactly how to do it. It blew my mind as a matter of fact, because I kept thinking, well, uh, then was it, was he manipulating? No, but, but in a way, as I said, when we began, I think it was his way of looking at it all and putting it in perspective. And he really was much better when the film had been done. It kind of was a catharsis for him in a way. And of course, to work with all his chums and loving family. And um, I think we always felt safe with him. He was a very good director. And uh, if he was satisfied and you felt okay, um, you knew you were in good hands and you could progress. I, it's very hard to answer your question. Um, when he's depressive, yes, with the family, it's hard to, to say to my little ones, and daddy's just staying upstairs tonight, he's gonna have his dinner up there, he's not feeling well, or I'd cover, of course. And, um, but he'd make up for it eventually, and, or, um, or be the best dad in the world for a while. I mean, it's so hard to, I think they were well aware that I was covering quite often. They weren't that old, but and certainly you all were. But, um, but somehow that crazy guy got through everything and charmed us. I was just thinking earlier today that, you know, this is this film is 38 years old. Wow. I was 23, 22, turning 23 when the film was made. I turned 60 this year. And I don't want to age... discuss my birthday no, at all. No, we won't Sorry. discuss yours. But Jack is turning 60 in the film, and that's what he's making such a fuss about. Yeah, and his mortality and... <laughs> is coming to hit him hard. Yeah, yeah. right. And I want to say, go get over yourself. Well, what was so sweet about the film is that it was really true. I mean, most of that, craziness, although Blake enhanced on it, and Blake wasn't an architect, but, and um, he didn't, um, he did, you know, sometimes get caught up in the weeds with the water spouts going off all over the lawn, <laughs> but not as much as he made of it, but the underlying truth was very much there. I wish you'd known him, Julia, I do. Once and I, you know when he did this, um, uh, they did a tribute to him in in, in at Guildhall. They did. Yeah, yeah. That's when I. That's when I. I really, yeah, oh, I'm so very, pleased. It was in passing, and it was a it was a very fascinating uh, conversation he had. Really? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. I, he probably didn't know how much you already knew. No, I was in the audience. I was. Uh, 
<laughs> this is the most knowledgeable lady on film you could possibly imagine. Wow. No, that's not. <laughs> no, you are. I mean, it's wonderful. You this could gentleman ask here has had his hand up. I'm yeah, sorry. This gentleman right here. Thank you. What is a conscious decision not to sing in the film? In this film? Yes. Well, it was about the fact that I'd lost my voice and or had an operation on my voice and was doubting whether I'd ever sing again. And so it goes right up to that moment when... Had I sung at the party, it would have belied the horse throat that I probably still had from having had my uh, biopsy. Bi biopsy done. And so, I mean, I kept thinking, God, I hope this isn't prophetic, you know. And in fact, there was a day when I did lose my voice, but for totally different, different reasons. But uh, the, the idea of my not singing and being saved by the fact that I could see my a film doctor in the back uh, writing, all is okay. Yeah, and so I was able to, just as I was about to sing, um, I was able to be let off from that, yeah. And yet it felt quite, it wasn't Tony um, uh, God, Bennett. Uh, Bennett, absolutely wonderful singing that song at the end, I forgot. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Lovely voice, nice man. <laughs> we have time for one more. Uh, Right at the back. Very, very back. Well, yeah. Um, how lucky are we to have you here? This is terrific. Thank you. Thank you. It's, I, I feel um, I should pay you all for therapy or something like that. <laughs> so yeah, you were terrific in the film. Uh, you're both terrific in the film, and especially hearing about the process, um, it's even more remarkable. Um, I think this film. Um, held up remarkably well, and I'm wondering how it was received when it first came out. Mixed reviews, I think. Some the good ones were really great and said how brave Blake was. That it was a comedy with very dark overtones, and that for him to be so um, open about those kind of things, and yet to make it about life rather than death, even though the character feared death, prob probably desperately. Um, I think they, some of the critics got it. Others, I think, felt it was light fare in those days. I think it's probably better now than it might have been. I loved it just the same. I didn't think it was light. You know, Good. I thought it was, it was just brilliant. Good. I'm glad. I love, I'm glad. Oh, one thing I would love to mention, unless there's somebody else that wants to ask a question. Anybody else? Uh, no, I don't see. Yes. Had you known that Henry Mancini would be your first? Had you chosen Henry Mancini for your uh, music in the film early on, or was that a decision made um, during the? Blake used Henry Mancini for just about ninety percent of all his films, um, uh, except for one or two, which were done. One was done by Jerry Goldsmith, and one was done by Michel Legrand. But he was an, uh, uh, Henry Mancini was a dear man and a very good friend to the family. And we got to know him awfully well. How lucky. He, he was darling, wasn't he? He was. And he, um, what was I going to say about this? Yeah, he had a great sense of humor, wicked. And, uh, I don't know, he was just lovely. And so it was a perfectly natural thing to do to mostly ask Henry. Oh, I know, I was going to say that he, uh, that you probably know this, but um, he met Henry on the lot of uh, uh, Universal. And Blake was going into the commissary and Henry was coming out. And he said, oh, Henry, and he didn't really know him. He'd only met him in passing. And he said, I'm doing, um, a, a television show called Peter Gunn. Would you be interested in doing a score for it? And Henry's answer, truth, honestly, was sure. Yeah, as long as would, would you let me write a jazz score for a detective story? And it is that famous Peter Gunn theme, which you probably have all heard, which is dum bum 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 ba da dee dee dee. You know that kind of a wonderful driving sound. And Blake didn't hear it until the first episode was edited and he just about fell off his chair he was so thrilled but Henry always came through on all of it
I think we have another show starting very soon, so we have to uh, finish this. I ask you to stay sit until Miss Andrews and Emma are. Thank you uh, for being ready. a wonderful and interview. Please thank, thank her so much. because. Thanks, Julia. You have been so generous with this retrospective. It is unbelievable. And this is the last time, isn't it? I have my have, have a surprise, <laughs> but <laughs> I may have one a more surprise. syndrome, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, but but anyway, and if you you know when you go out, if you go on the third floor in the interactive screen, you you'll see the treatment of that slide, so you can actually read the characters. It's really? on, yeah, it's on the interactive. Screen. Is that the treatment that was written down as the whole film, or just yes, what was yeah. wanted? Yes, it's, it's the it's, whole film. Yeah, so that must have been yeah. done. You have the description yeah. of the characters, and you can see between the lines. You know what we were talking about. Well, thanks again for coming. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.